Hi everyone, thanks for joining today. My name is John Narona and I'm Senior Director of Product Management at Optimizely. And today I want to share some lessons I've learned in my own career about how to build an effective culture of experimentation on a product team and avoid some of the common pitfalls and challenges that happen along the way as you start to implement experimentation in your product team's culture. What do I mean by a culture of experimentation? What is that? I like to contrast it to a sort of older way of doing things that's very waterfall. And it's one that I think many of us as product managers can relate to. It's one where every new feature starts with a, a design phase where we brainstorm, we mock up, we wireframe, come up with a couple ideas, and in the end, we pick one option to pursue and go forward with. That's then followed by a long build phase where we take this thing we've been designing and we build it out in a very linear fashion, one step after another over a period of months or years. And that all leads up to one big moment of truth that, that is launch day where it all goes live to our users. I don't know about you, but when I've been in these situations of having designed something for several months, built it for months or years, and the moment of launch finally comes along, I get pretty nervous. The final stage of this cycle is pray. Hope for the best and hope that our users actually resonate with the thing that we've been building all of this time. The problem with this approach is that it can often feel like we're groping around in the dark with a blindfold on. Uh, think of the feeling of you know, having to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. You stumble around, you stub your toe. Most of all, you move very slowly and cautiously. We're so afraid that our code will break or that our users won't like what we've built that we move very nervously and slowly as a result. But there's a better way to operate than this. And that way is all about experimentation. It's replacing this final stage of launching and praying with a much more confident one of experimenting and iterating. What does that look like in practice? You can think of this as a cycle of product experimentation, and it's something that the savviest teams out there are already doing. The first step is thinking hypothetically. That means approaching every product launch as an idea that can be validated or disproven rather than as a guaranteed thing to just churn out as fast as possible. There's a range of techniques that go into this kind of hypothesis thinking of product development. Everything from pain and door testing, validating hypothesis, qualitative research, exploratory testing. But the whole idea is to take that grain of an idea and expose it to real users as early and quickly as possible so you can actually move on from bad ideas and spend more time on the most valuable, impactful things that your team could be doing. The next stage of the cycle is all about mitigating risk. It's about taking an idea you've now designed and planned out and building it in a way that is safe and that you can feel confident in. When I, feel, when I say safe, what I have in mind are all the cases where someone's had a big idea for a product launch and it's exploded in their faces. So think of a big redesign that turns off users or even a software launch that has a bunch of bugs. It actually raises experimentation at every step to mitigate that problem and design in more safety to the whole release process. And then finally, the real need of product experimentation is this last piece of red, quantifying product impact. How do we actually validate these ideas really had the impact we wanted? And how do we truly measure them, not just across one launch, but our entire portfolio of launches? How do we know that all of these things are having a good effect and the impact that we wanted? And how do we steer more of our investment towards the kinds of product launches that are making the biggest impact for our users? If you think about what it looks like to have this whole cycle in place, it's a dream, it's a pinnacle. It's a true culture of experimentation and agility on your team. But getting there can be quite a journey. It's a lot of work to actually build up a culture of experimentation like that. And something I think about a lot is how can we help more and more product teams climb this ladder and get to that true state of building a culture of experimentation, one where every product launch is going through the cycle in a repeatable, reliable way. I'll share a bit of my own experience that I bring to the table here, and that is getting my start as a product manager at Microsoft just after one of the most famous and frankly disastrous waterfall launches of all time, and that was Windows Vista. So Vista, probably many of you know, was a classic Big Bang software launch. Microsoft spent years building its new operating system, and they released it all at once, which of course is how you had to work at the time. We all build software by printing out CDs and putting them in boxes and wrapping them in shrink wrap and mailing them out to a million Best Buys around the world. But of course, the danger of that model is you only find out about four years into the cycle that users may not like the thing you built, that it may not resonate or may just not work on several different levels. So I joined Microsoft at a time of real soul searching after this launch, trying to think, how can we operate differently? And how can we bring this culture of agility and continuous experimentation into everything that we build? 
So when I joined, I wanted to be at the forefront of that transition, and therefore, I decided to work on Bing. It was Microsoft's attempt to build a true internet scale online service with that spirit of agility built in at the very heart of it. Of course, when I mentioned Bing, you may be thinking of headlines like this one, which always draw some laughs. Uh, this is back from 2011, around the time I joined Bing, when we were losing only about $100,000 per hour. Honestly, it was a sucking black hole of money. And the reason was that we built something new and hard. It took time to actually turn that into something that could really deliver on the level of a Google or even a Yahoo. But we had a mission over those several years of turning it around, of building up a search engine that could truly compete against one of the titans of the internet. And what you may not know is that we actually had quite a turnaround at Microsoft over the next four years. We went from losing $500,000 an hour to actually becoming profitable. And not sure profitable, but making billions of dollars every year in the big division. And if I think about that transformation and how it happened, I'd really pinpoint the key to that change as building this culture of experimentation across Bing and doing so across all of Microsoft. What you see here is a graph of how many experiments we were running every week at Bing. So at the very beginning in 2008 when Bing launched, it was just a handful here and there, a few teams trying basic A-B tests or feature rollouts in different areas. But over time, we built a really powerful muscle around doing this. To the point where in 2013, when I left Bing, we were running hundreds of experiments every week. What that means was that every single piece of the user experience and everything underneath it was powered by some kind of experiment or AV test. We were testing the search algorithms, we were testing the user experience, we were testing the ads. Everything that could be tested was tested to actually understand and measure the impact it would have and ensure that only things that had a positive impact on the user experience shipped. So this was eye-opening for me. I saw firsthand the sheer power of A-B testing and experimentation and what it could do for a product team. But I also saw the challenges firsthand because frankly, being there on the team that was actually building these experiments, it didn't feel like the smooth red line you see on the screen. It felt like the very bumpy black one where we had big advances in experimentation, but also a lot of real setbacks that took us back to zero. And so today I want to share a few of my experiences there of what we learned at Microsoft that can help a lot of other companies learn. Part of my experience here also comes from my time at Optimizely. Optimizely is the world's leading experimentation platform. We're so committed to A-B testing that we even do it on our elevators. And we are all about taking lessons from places like Microsoft and making them available to every company in the world to apply the same experimental mindset. And so from that perch leading product here at Optimizely, I've also seen so many other cases where companies have made good strides towards experimentation, but then fallen off some kind of cliff or gotten stuck. So for the rest of this session, I'll be sharing a few of the pitfalls, a few common challenges we see over and over again in driving that culture of experimentation. Starting with what I think is the most important of all, which is optimizing for the right metrics, or in this case, the pitfall is optimizing for the wrong metrics. Uh, so in case you're not familiar with A-B testing, the basic idea is that you take some aspect of your application or your site or your product and you change it. So maybe you change some copy on a button, or maybe you change the algorithm powering your search results or an API that you got. And then you actually split up your traffic so that half the users get one variation and half the users get the other. And then you measure the difference between those two cohorts. How do the people who saw variation B behave differently from the ones who saw variation A? And it turns out when you do that, you can measure some pretty remarkable and precise differences in conversion behavior and overall behavior. Uh, but the key to that is actually choosing the right metric. How do you decide what you're going to measure? And how do you really know that your changes are leading to a better overall experience? It has to be because you've chosen some aspect of behavior to measure. It's not always obvious what that should be. And to illustrate that, I've chosen two different travel sites, both the very successful products. You see Booking.com on the left and Airbnb on the right. If you've ever used Booking and Airbnb, you might notice they have a very different UX. Booking.com is very urgency oriented. It's all about book now or else. Whereas Airbnb is very slow and leisurely. It's got big photos of the properties. But only they're both doing the same thing. They're both helping you find a place to stay in a new city that you're traveling to. So how do the user experiences diverge so very far? And how do each of these companies use A-B testing differently? Well, it turns out they've got different metrics they're optimizing for that really guide the entire user experience. At Booking, they're really anchored on bookings per session. So what percent of the time that someone lands on the site, do they actually book a stay in one of these hotels? 
And so everything on this page is doing work to make you book a stay immediately as soon as possible and keep you from leaving the page and doing something else. Airbnb, on the other hand, is tracking repeat bookings per visitor. So how often after the first time you come back again and again to actually book travel with Airbnb? And I would say on the face of it, these are both reasonable metrics, but as you can see, they lead to wildly different user experiences at the end of the day. And that's because ultimately your metrics guide every decision you make through experimentation. And ideally those experiments guide every decision you make about which features you actually ship and prioritize. So I'll share a story of my own from Bing on this subject. Uh, when I joined Bing, we really struggled with what should our new North Star metric be? How do we know that we're making the search experience better? So after a lot of head scratching and thinking, we ended up aligning on the metric of queries per unique user. In other words, how often is any given user searching on Bing? And implicitly, we want to know how far they're using us instead of something like Google or Yahoo. So it was a competitive metric. And this sounded great on the surface because if people liked us, they would search more, they would do more, and we get more usage. But it's a great example of a well-intentioned, seemingly logical metric that completely backfired on us. And I'll show you how. Uh, by showing you the product I actually worked on on Bing, which was image search. So here's how Bing image search looked at the time that I was working on Bing. You'll see there's a search for Seattle with a couple different pictures for it. And now here's the same experience searching on Google image search. So again, here's Google and here's Bing. And just think about what you notice about the difference between these two experiences. They're obviously in the same ballpark. They're doing the same thing. There's a pretty big difference. And I would say the biggest difference is not the quality or anything else. It's that Google is showing you a whole lot more images, which is the thing you were searching for, whereas Bing was showing you a lot of stuff that wasn't really the pictures you'd search for. And that actually wasn't an accident. This design was the result of very careful, continuous A-B test and iteration. So what went wrong? Well, you'll notice that all these things I've outlined in green here actually lead to another search on the site. Whereas all the things in red, the actual search results, they don't do that. They don't count as a new search. They actually end your search session and send you away. And ironically, uh, Google's actually uh, owned this fact about their own search. They've taken credit for saying, we're the only website on earth that tries to get rid of our users as quickly as possible. So the further we got a thing, the further we realized that maybe the metric we'd chosen was almost the opposite of what we needed. We were incentivizing product teams to keep users staying inside of Bing forever, whereas Google was encouraging its product teams to get them out of there as quickly as possible. And that was making for a qualitative difference in the kind of product we were building. So we had to actually step back and reconsider this metric. And we ended up deciding that we didn't want to optimize for queries per unique user. In some ways, that was a negative. We actually had to break this down into two different pieces. We wanted to decrease the number of queries per session so that you got where you're going more quickly. We wanted to increase the number of sessions per user so that people came back again and again over time. What I hope this illustrates is that it's actually pretty hard to choose the right metric and you have to keep reevaluating it. And you often need to use qualitative signals to validate the quantitative metrics you've chosen to optimize for. And frankly, no data driven team wants to hear this, but you've got to trust your gut and ask yourself, is this really what we want? Uh, another way of asking this is, how would our users feel if they knew that this was the thing that we were optimizing for? Another one is, what if only this number went up and every other metric stayed flat? Would we be happy about our program and all the experimentation that we're doing? Another useful lens for this is to think about your conversion tree or your goal tree. So often we have some ultimate uh, underlying thing we're trying to move as a product. For an e-commerce site, it might be revenue. And then a series of inputs to that that actually add up to it. So for example, revenue is revenue per visitor times your number of visitors. And that multiple is what you ultimately care about, but you can move each component individually. So many teams find success by deciding which way each of these things should point, and then actually assigning ownership of these metrics to different teams so everybody can have a stake in improving the outcome. Now, let's say you actually get this under control. So you do figure out how to drive the right behavior, but uh, are you still gonna really have the effect you want? This is where I see another challenge that we come pretty frequently, which is just thinking too small about experimentation. It's easy to get tied up in micro-optimizations and simplistic A-B tests. In fact, I generally shy away from the term A-B testing because it encourages the wrong mindset. In particular, it encourages literally testing just an A and a B, or only two variations. But that misses out on some of the creative potential your team can have if you really go beyond that and start to think, what are all the options we can test? What are all the ideas we can try? 
And we often see that when people force themselves to go beyond just two variants, they get a lot more creative. They take things that were below the cut line or thrown out of the brainstorming stage and bring them back to life. And in doing so, you start to realize that there are actually some pretty good ideas out there that you could be trying out. And quantitatively, we've seen from the millions of experiments run across Optimizer's platform that there's a real difference here. It turns out that most companies are only really testing two variations at a time, but that when they test more than that, you have a drastic improvement in the overall rendering. We actually see that there's a peak around five variants, so a control and four variations, where you almost double your chances of seeing a significant winner or significant loser, both of which are huge learning opportunities to see what's actually going on. So if you dabble in A-B testing but haven't gotten results you want, I really recommend trying bigger, bolder changes and also more of them to really get to those key differentiators. Just to expand your thinking, I'll share a quote from Booking that we saw earlier. At Booking, every single day, they're running a thousand concurrent experiments to validate new ideas. And these experiments run across the entire product line. This is the other key, it's all about depth. So don't just test surface level changes like the color of a button. At Booking, they're testing search algorithms, they're testing support experiences, they're testing the mobile apps and the front of the website and the internal tools. Every single change to their product, from our biggest redesign to the smallest bug fix, is actually wrapped in an experiment to validate the impact. Now, this is a little extreme, but think about how you can push your own teams to get even 5%, 10% of the way towards a lofty goal like that. One way to do this is to think broadly about what experimentation means. At Optimizer, we think it's not just about A-B testing in a narrow sense. At every step of the software development lifecycle, you can bring in more kinds of experimentation. A good example is the painted door test. Before you ever build a new feature, Try mocking up the lightest possible version in your front end and exposing it to users and just see who clicks on it. And when they do, be honest, say, hey, we're thinking of building this new save for later functionality. We want to see what you think. Do you have any suggestions for us? See what kind of qualitative feedback you get. Follow up with them for more in-person usability sessions. And only once you really know there's concrete demand for your thing, then go out and do the work to build it. Development teams can embrace feature flagging and do way more to actually uh, incorporate experimentation into things like API launches and performance tweaks and new backend services. And finally, I noticed that many teams put all the work into getting to launch and then abandon their feature right afterwards. But so much of the value can be harnessed after the launch doing small iterative tests to tune the user experience or drive more discovery and adoption of the thing you've already made. There's so much value left on the table in that feature factory mindset. Finally, I really encourage thinking about different approaches to doing experimentation. Marketing teams are often used to doing what's called client-side experimentation, where you're actually making changes that run in the user's browser to tweak something in the DOM, so a visual change, like an image test or a wording test. But they miss out on the full depth of what's possible by reaching into the core product. Vice versa, many product teams do what's called server-side testing, where they're using some kind of SDK to actually implement an if statement in their code where one path goes one way, one path goes the other way. This is super powerful for running deeper experiments, but it requires developers involved every step of the way. The savviest teams are using both client-side and server-side options to do this. And that's why at Optimizer, we actually offer both in our web and full stack products. So you can test every kind of idea at the right velocity for that hypothesis. Uh, so with that, I want to just share one more thought, which is rollouts. Uh, development teams can do a lot to actually incorporate the same mindset in every single feature launch. You can actually prove the impact of new features and measure them by rolling out a feature just to 50% of your traffic and rolling it back if anything goes wrong. Think of this as a lightweight form of experimentation that you can use to actually validate your hypotheses and ensure that you've actually ironed all the kinks and bugs out of the process. All right, a final pitfall, and that's hoarding insights on one team. It's really easy to run a successful A-B test and then keep it to yourself. But the truth is, A-B testing is a long, elaborate cycle that starts from the earliest hypothesis step to the latest step of sharing your ideas. But too often, teams are using tools like post-it notes and forgotten spreadsheets to track these ideas, Jira boards that nobody actually likes. And as a result, you're missing the opportunity to share the insights from what actually happened in these experiments. What we've found is the most effective experimenters are actually taking this information and building a system for sharing it all across different teams. Uh, because what we find is the best experimentation programs are the ones that are just one person or two people experimenting. 
They're an entire culture where everybody's involved in ideation and analysis of what you're doing. It anchors everybody to the customer through data. That's why at Optimizely, we have incorporated what we call program management into our product. It's all about giving teams a centralized place to gather ideas, score them, vote on what they think is going to happen, and then track the progress through every step of the way. The beauty of this is that you don't just source new ideas, you also capture the insights of every experiment. And this is so critical. If you're not actually sharing the results of what you've done out to the rest of your team, whether it's by email or PowerPoint, then you're missing the most important part of an experiment, which isn't accidentally increasing conversion rates, it's understanding users better and bringing that insight into every subsequent product launch that you do. One last pitfall, and then we'll conclude. And that one is thinking about stats. How do you actually interpret the results of an experiment and know that you've had the effect that you want to have? It's really easy for teams to get tricked by the stats on their experiment. And to illustrate that, I'll show a simple schematic of an AP test. In this case, like I said earlier, it's more than just an A and B. We've actually got four different variations we're testing, and perhaps five different metrics we're measuring at different stages of the funnel. So you can actually think of this as not so much an A-B test, but actually 20 different A-B tests that we're doing. Each variation on each metric represents a change that we're trying to measure and understand better. Now, the problem with an A-B test we run like this, at least for many of us, is that we're really eager to get the results. I've been in this place before where I've had some big new feature I'm launching, I kick it off, and I'm just so excited to see the results. I don't even want to involve a data scientist or analyst. I just want to know what's going to happen. I'm like the kid in the famous marshmallow test, where I've been told I need to wait for a couple days to get data. I know I shouldn't jump the gun analysis, but I just really want to know how my idea is doing. This is a very understandable motive, but there's a real problem with it, is, which is the risk of false positives. False positives are where you run an experiment, you start to see some results, but they aren't the true movement in the underlying metrics. And what that means is that if you keep peeking at the same results page, you'll notice your results line up like a Christmas tree, where what was doing badly is now doing well, and vice versa. And it becomes very hard to trust those results and communicate them to others because it seems unreliable. This is the point of using data. You have to be careful with peaking and A-B testing. And by peaking, we mean any time where you're peaking at the results and looking at them before they're quote unquote ready. And let me explain what ready means. It varies depending on your A-B testing platform. In general, whenever you start an experiment and look at those results, we call that a peak. You're looking at the results. And quite often, we look at the results and see something we don't want. We see that the results are inconclusive, so we refresh again, and then again, and then again until we finally see the result that we want. And this is a pretty innocuous thing to do. It's certainly very common, except there's actually a real danger in here, which is that with traditional stats, each one of these peaks actually increases your chance of getting a false positive, almost like spinning a revolver multiple times in the game Russian roulette. You're actually increasing your risk of danger every single time. So actually, those four peaks you took in this case lead to not a 95% chance of getting the right answer, but an 18% chance of seeing a false positive. Another challenge was called multiple comparisons. I think the best illustration of it is this XKCD comment from a couple of years ago, where somebody's asked the question, do jelly beans cause acne? And they do the study and they find out no, but they really want to find something they can publish. And so they dig in and they start to ask, okay, do purple jelly beans cause acne? Do red jelly beans cause acne? Do yellow jelly beans cause acne? And they repeat this test over and over uh, for different subgroups or metrics. And in doing so, you actually blow off the number of tests that you're running that each have this one in 20 chance of going wrong. This is the multiple comparisons problem with probability. It's a famous one that scientists still struggle with to this day. And it leads to this huge crisis where people are publishing results that aren't really true, where they're overstating their confidence. We say green jelly beans cause acne, and we ignore the fact that there were nine killer cases where we didn't really see anything. And we say there's only a 5% chance of this coincidence, but really it's much higher because we mix these things. This was a real problem for us at Bing. We had hundreds of metrics we were testing, multiple variations, and because of that, every test we ran was something like this. It was a lot of metrics lighting up red or green in our A-B tests, often due to pure statistical noise. It was all random chance. And just think about it, if you have 100 different metrics that you're testing, you shouldn't be surprised when five of them light up as positives or negatives for no reason. That's exactly what a 95% significance rate means, but it's easy to lose sight of that in the moment 
and get all worked up over a misleading result. That's why at Optimizing, we've actually retooled our stats to correct for these issues. We do false discovery rate control, and we also correct for the multiple comparisons problem along the way. And this is all about trying to protect from these common errors. So just to conclude, product experimentation is a very powerful set of techniques. It completely changes how a product team operates and can anchor you much more closely to real customer problems and needs and avoid some of the worst kinds of launches we've seen in many products. But there's a couple pitfalls along the way, and it's really important to be thoughtful about how you build an experimentation culture, building both the right team and the right tools to get there. Thank you very much.